Okay. Hello all, my name is Marisa Aveda and here is my presentation on environmental factors and their effect on the adolescent diet. I've got a screen sharing situation going on, so um, bear with me. I'm excited to get started. Okay, so a little bit about me. Like I said, my name is Marisa Aveda. I'm a nutritional sciences student at the University of Arizona, there's our University of Arizona A, Bear Down. Um, I am an RD to be, and that just means that I'm a future registered dietitian. So I'm studying nutritional sciences in hopes of becoming a registered dietitian. And I actually just sent news, I will be attending Oregon Health and Science University in the fall to complete um, my dietetic internship and become uh, a registered dietitian. I'm a senior at the University of Arizona this year, so I'm excited to be moving on to OHSU. So a registered dietitian is basically a food and nutrition expert, and that's what I'm studying to become. Dietitians can work in private and public health care, education, corporate wellness, research, and the food industry in general. In comparison to a nutritionist, a nutritionist does a lot of self-study. There is no actual credential. But just like an RN has RN next to their name, I will take the test and um, hopefully become a registered dietitian to have RD next to mine. Um, I really want to work um, in a community outpatient center working with underserved communities and focusing on nutrition education. Nutrition has so much research to back up that it can prevent so many chronic illnesses, whether that's on one side of the spe spectrum of ob obesity caused illnesses to the other um, like disordered eating and eating disorder related illnesses. However, it only works when people have access to this education. So I'm really working on the idea of reaching out to some underserved communities and be able to um, share my knowledge there. So I'm looking forward to sharing this presentation with you guys. And I worked with your teacher, Mrs. Andrews, and we are going to be covering topic 8.3, discuss the impact of environmental factors on the adolescent's diet. So my goal is to explain what environmental factors are, help you learn what specific environmental factors impact the adolescent ages, and then educate on how these environmental factors can have a negative effect on the adolescent's diet. And it's important to first be able to recognize the many environmental factors before questioning how healthy the adolescent diet is because if we're just questioning intake and not questioning um, how that intake is getting there, whether it means socioeconomic status and income, um, it's really important that we assess all the important aspects that affect the adolescent and their diet. So just a little bit about our agenda, what we're going to go over. Um, in this lesson, we will first discuss environmental factors and then define the environmental factors, be able to list them, and then specify how these environmental factors actually affect the adolescent diet. By the end of this lesson, you students, should be able to define environmental factors, be able to list five environmental factors that commonly affect adolescents, and explain how environmental factors can have negative effects by the end of this lesson. So these are the goals that we're looking to achieve in this particular lesson. Hopefully you were able to complete the pre-class survey um, via SurveyMonkey. Um, if you weren't, that is completely okay. It only was intended to prime you for the lesson. Let me be able to share some of your data and um, also assess some of your own environmental factors or even barriers to your own healthy eating. So I will be providing moments for in-class discussion activities for you either to, depending on your teacher's preference, um, write down, preferably share with a partner and um, even more so share with your class and create just a, a nice discussion. This actually relates to you guys as adolescents. So if you are able to um, have a discussion, an in-class discussion, and kind of deepen this knowledge, that would be fantastic. So at those moments, I'll let you guys know and you guys can just pause my video and um, feel free to talk as long as you need to. And then just resume whenever you guys are completed. And if at any time you have any questions, please feel free to jot them down. I will share my uh, personal email 
at the end of the class. And um, please just ask your, jot these questions down to ask your teacher, Mrs. Andrews, or for me at the end of this lesson. And without further ado, let's get started. So adolescence, um, you may possibly think that this does not occur to you. I, for me, adolescence was maybe 10, 10 to 14 younger ages, but adolescence is defined as a transitional phase of growth and development between childhood and adulthood. The World Health Organization defines an adolescent as a person between ages 10 and 19. So that's according to Britannica.com. So this includes your exact ages. Take a moment, take that in, your adolescence. So when I'm talking about this um, topic in terms of adolescent diet, I really want you to start considering that this is you as well. So when we discuss adolescence, think of yourselves and some ages that are younger, um, your younger siblings in middle school all the way down to 10. I think that's like third, third grade. Um, so 10 to 19 is the ages and maybe a little bit older, your friend that just graduated. So in a study completed by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, there were many obstacles found in the adolescent diet, outside obstacles known as environmental factors, excuse me. And these are going to be listed on the slide next. And I want you to stop and pause the video and think about your own environmental factors that may affect you as adolescents in terms of diet. So I'm gonna pause, you guys pause the video and I'm gonna let you guys do that. So you guys have paused the video, you've considered environmental factors in adolescence. Let's define environmental factors further for my purposes. Environmental factors refers to socioeconomic, racial and ethnic and relational con conditions that may influence a person's ability to cope with stress. So if you guys need to repause, if that makes a little bit more sense and you wanna do that again, but when we consider socioeconomic status, that's income racial and ethnic and relational conditions. That's um, some cultural differences and uh, racial and, and family uh, differences that may be environmental factors on something and may influence how a person copes with stress. So when you think of stressors, I want you to think of environmental factors. So this is really important for you guys to be able to define this and um, then we can move forward. Now we have some definitions and now we can get into it. So factors that specifically affect the adolescent diet. Um, here's some, hopefully you guys were able to touch on a few of these, but if not, here are some. So hunger, this is a great one. Can't eat, you're not hungry. Food cravings, the appeal of food. Um, this goes with setting. If you, you're not into your parents' meatloaf, you're not gonna eat it. If you're not into the cafeteria's sandwiches, you're not gonna eat it. If you don't want the McDonald's pancakes, you're not gonna eat it. So the appeal of food, your craving of food is all really important. Time considerations of adolescents and parents. So if your parents did not have enough time to prepare a meal for you and you're running out the door, heading to your first class and uh, you, you slept in, you don't have time to grab a proper breakfast. So those time considerations are really important to consider as environmental factors, as stressors that affect the adolescent diet. Um, convenience of food. If it's available, you're going to eat it. Um, I remember in high school, a lot of my convenience of food was granola bars, even in college now. <laughs> Can, if it's convenient, I'm going to eat it. And so maybe if that means cafeteria food, or if you have an open campus, you're able to leave for lunch. Um, or maybe food is inconvenient. You, you don't have access, regular, consistent access to food. That goes with convenience of food. Um, food availability, and this includes grocery stores, cost, and access. So if you have grocery stores nearby, maybe whether or not you have grocery stores nearby, um, the cost of your grocery stores, if they are high in cost, um, and then access, if you don't have a car to get to that grocery store, or maybe your family has one car, and it's, it's impossible to be able to share that. So that all goes into food availability. If you cannot obtain food, your food availability is affected. Parental influence. 
Uh, we'd love to say that we have autonomy there, but parental influence is huge in this age because if your parents are buying food that goes with convenience, um, you're gonna go with that convenience of food and that parental influence of maybe pushing healthier foods on you when you wouldn't otherwise consume them. It's really important to be able to consider those ideas. And sorry, my line of sight. Influence on eating behaviors and that includes culture and religion. So for example, um, if your culture or religion does not permit red meat or you only eat meat on a certain day, those are all really important um, aspects to consider on environmental factors because they're not, they may not be your own individual choices or they may, but environmentally, you've been placed in a situation where these affect your diet. So it's important to consider that. And then perceived benefits of food. Um, this goes, it's a little bit of environmental and your own ideas because your own ideas come make up your perceived benefits. However, if you've been taught by your environment, whether that's friends, family, teachers, coaches, parents, if you've been taught by that environment to have these certain benefits in foods, and this is why you should eat it, that goes into an influence on an environmental factor on your adolescent diet. So these factors are just extremely important to consider. They also include, um, like I said, socioeconomic, racial, and ethnic considerations. And in this case, this definition applies to stress as in food security, which basically means how secure is your next meal in your head. Um, have you ever had to wonder, just think about this for a second, have you ever had to wonder where your next meal was coming from or stress about where your next meal was coming from, whether it was against these environmental factors that I have listed above um, or related to these environmental factors, it's important to assess where these stressors are coming from. So maybe you didn't have to stress where your next meal was coming from, but you would have to stress how much time you had to prepare that meal or um, how inconvenient it was. That's a, that's a good one that everyone can relate to is how inconvenient is it to get out of bed and prepare myself food when I can get an extra 10 minutes of sleep. So when you look at these, these are all stressors and environmental factors that in turn affect the adolescent diet. So now from the examples we've shared, actually let's continue and then I'll do. Okay, so I actually, I made this figure, this is, Pretend this is an adolescent, uh, I, I adjusted this figure, I should say, I didn't completely make it. Um, and this is their environment. So we have the home, maybe some outside sources like television, maybe some stressors like a test and grades, reading, assigned reading or chosen reading, um, cost, money, jobs, relationships, partners, um, sports, social media, uh, attention from social media, your own happiness, um, what makes you happy, uh, your phone. So along with social media, you still have messaging. Uh, you still have different stuff outside of your attention that you receive from that. Once again, reading just, um, and personally, they all affect your diet. So that was the purpose of this figure. I want you guys to pause the video, take um, honestly about five five or six minutes and consider your own obstacles or stressors that I may have not mentioned or put a name to them if you are in basketball. Explain why basketball is a stressor and why it would impact your diet. If you um, watch TV or if you have outside sources impacting your diet, why? Why would social media ever impact your diet? Consider that and share it please. Um, so pause the video and go ahead and share. Great, okay, hopefully you guys pause the video and you were able to share some environmental factors that you specifically deal with. I think this figure was a great way to show some of them, um, but all their effect on diet is extremely important to consider, especially for the purpose of this lesson, especially because you guys are adolescents. So it's um, awesome to know that this is relatable to you and you can make this relatable to yourselves. Um, okay, 
So these are called situation specific factors. I have um, little references and then I have references at the end in case you need them. So in one study that was, I have cited at the end, they called them situation specific factors. And basically what that meant was these ones that I mentioned earlier are general factors, hunger, food cravings, appeal of food. And those might be varying among students. However, situation specific factors are specific to each student because not everyone has the same mood. Even if you're siblings, you, you don't have the same mood. Your own body image, your habits, the cost of food, um, social media and media in general. That's why I added uh, TV and books and messaging. It's the media in general, um, diets, vegan, uh, vegetarianism. These are all situation specific factors that may greatly of greatly affect your own eating habits and your dietary behaviors or may minimally affect your own dietary behaviors. So it's really important to consider these and um, really uh, look at the obstacles and stressors. And this was actually based on a study titled Individual and Environmental Factors Influencing Adolescents' Dietary Behavior in Low and Middle Income Settings. And so as you see on this slide, it's important to assess these and their effect of the key dietary behaviors um, because they have a complex role to influence the adolescent diet. And so we'll actually move on to show this complex role. So other environmental factors, hopefully I was able to share um, a lot that maybe you guys didn't consider. However, um, I hope that your conversation was also fruitful in that sense and you were able to share a lot of your own environmental factors that um, you go through on an everyday basis. So other environmental factors, um, individual. So this one has kind of a caveat to it because individual factors are not necessarily from the environment, they're from yourself. However, I think that it's extremely important to be able to consider these, look at them, take some time on them, so um, hopefully uh, this, is, this is a good review. So individual is defined as perceived, it's um, according to this journal, by the way. Um, individual is perceived benefits, barriers, self-efficacy, habit, stre habit strength, and a better understanding of healthy food. So your own understanding of healthy food is gonna be a factor that affects your diet. If you uh, do not consider uh, fats to be healthy, you're not going to eat fats. If you do not consider the value of phytonutrients like fruits and vegetables, you're not going to eat fruits and vegetables. So it's really important to have your own understanding of what healthy food is to you and whether or not you have a desire to um, consume healthy food. If there's no desire there, then that's understandable that um, maybe uh, that's another an environmental factor on whether or not you consume it. Social environment. So as uh, high school students, I'm sure you guys are tired of hear this, hearing this, but your environment is, you are a product of your environment. And this includes your social environment. Um, uh, this includes physical as including access, access to healthy food, your social environment um, regarding friends and uh, relationships and just people that surround you is extremely important along with parental permissiveness. I love this. This was according to this journal and parental permissiveness is just if your parents do not permit sugars to be in the house, it makes a lot of sense that you don't consume sugars unless outside of the house. So when you're thinking of parental permissiveness, think of maybe restriction, but also what they do permiss, uh, what is permissible in their house. If there is a high amount of processed foods, snacks, um, candy, soda available in your house and your parents allow you to consume it, that's an environmental factor on your diet because um, while you guys are a lot older, you make your own decisions, you have your own reasons for the way you eat or maybe you don't, um, when you're looking at the 10 to 14, they're growing in their own autonomy. However, parents are permissive of soda daily and um, or maybe um, only permissive of high amounts of fruits and vegetables, that is going to be a huge environmental factor on their consumption. So parental permissiveness, I love the way that they, this study phrased it. I think it's so incredibly important to consider that, especially in an adolescent age. 
um, as, as you're growing in autonomy or maybe you are uh, super independent, this still is um, an important aspect. So also school support. So school lunches, school meals, um, extremely important, especially when you are, um, do you have access to free and reduced lunch? School support is another social environmental factor. If schools are not providing a high amount of healthy food, it, um, it, it affects dietary behaviors. Um, next is dietary behavior. So uh, fruit and vegetables, sugary drinks, breakfast, and unhealthy snack intake. So I actually will be able to delve deeper into a study um, a little bit later in this presentation. However, dietary consumption is extremely important in these age groups, um, especially adolescent, um, where you guys are at because of your developing bodies um, growing through, going through changes such as puberty, such as um, higher activity and physical activity levels, especially if you are in a strenuous sport. So these dietary behaviors, sugar, um, consumption of sugary drinks, um, inadequate dairy, high sodium, high um, processed foods, inadequate fruits and vegetables, inadequate fiber, all of those wonderful micronutrients and macronutrients, um, they're also characterized by high carbohydrate. It's really important to consider the dietary behavior. Um, breakfast, lunch, do you have three meals a day? Stuff that you need to consider um, when looking at other environmental factors that we may have not uh, listed. Unhealthy snack intake. We'll get a little bit into snacks later, which I think was important. So um, those are more obstacles and stressors. So this was a great study. It, um, excuse me. Uh, it just really talked a lot about environment and these are the environmental factors that um, we need to consider here. And so these are the individual factors that I was going over. This should be the same study from that same journal. Um, the individual factors that we're looking at are self-efficacy, subject, subjective norm, what you believe to be um, normal, regular, attitudinal beliefs, barriers and benefits. Um, we're looking at your own attitude about food. Maybe you do not believe in eating meat. And so that's an attitude that you have as an individual factor that affects your dietary behavior. Um, and perceived food safety. Um, again, once again, you you don't believe that this certain kind of food is safe for you to eat or you prefer not to eat raw meat or something like that. That's all super important and taste. Taste is a wonderful individual factor as I mentioned earlier um, by food, uh, what did I say, excuse me. Something to the effect of food permissiveness. And so taste is another individual factor that's gonna represent your dietary behavior. If you do not like bananas, you're just not gonna eat them. They don't taste right to you. I get it, I respect it. Um, okay, so here's our some more environmental factors. So sociocultural changes, this includes increased workload, changed food patterns. These go into availability and accessibility, extremely important. As I mentioned earlier, if you don't have access to the grocery store, you can't get food. If you don't have the time to permit it, you can't get food. These are constraints that affect your dietary behavior. So your family parenting practices, remember I talked about parent permissiveness, love that phrasing. Rules, um, we talked about uh, maybe if your parents are restricting sugary beverages or maybe they don't uh, necessarily encourage role modeling, they don't encourage um, healthy food habits like consumption of fruits and vegetables. That's all extremely important because it's environmental factors that affect the adolescent. Financial constraints, um, finances are a huge role in this because if uh, maybe you can't afford some foods or healthier foods or organic foods, it's still gonna affect your dietary behavior. A whole other um, lesson would be on is organic healthy or not, or healthy foods on a budget. But in general, does it affect dietary behavior? Yes. Um, lack of self-control, um, maybe in the family that's taught, that's a taught practice. Uh, that, that goes again to disordered eating patterns, which is something completely different, but still extremely important when it, we're looking at and assessing its effect on dietary behavior. Um, so school, school practices, rules, support, um, once again, lack of self-control, maybe in a different setting that affects dietary behavior. Um, but another thing I wanna mention here, as I mentioned earlier, free and reduced lunch, if, you, if it's provided at school, 
or maybe the availability for you to receive that at school. That's extremely important. Another huge factor on dietary behavior in the adolescent diet. And some moderators are financial autonomy and socioeconomic status, things that maybe level the playing field or affect the playing field. Um, just again, other really important factors and stressors on uh, dietary behavior. So how do these environmental factors affect healthy eating? I'm gonna do another pause guys, um, five minutes again. There's so much to talk about here. I really want you guys to assess. We've talked about all these wonderful, oh no. We've talked about all these wonderful environmental factors maybe. And now I want you guys to go back and just consider how would they affect healthy eating? So once again, five, six minutes, please pause the video share with a neighbor, share with your teacher, write them down, but um, let's try to have a class discussion and um, talk about how it affects healthy eating. So pause. Great. Okay, hopefully you're back. Didn't watch me too, uh, sitting here awkwardly too long. How do these environmental factors affect healthy eating? Extremely important, let's go into it. Um, Okay, um, low consumption of fruits and vegetables. On average, uh, adolescent ages consume, consume 3.4 to 3.5 servings instead of the recommended five servings. So once again, I have little studies that um, I have referenced at the end and in some of these slides. So um, this study actually found that males consumed 3.4 servings and females consumed 3.5 on average of the recommended five servings of fruits and vegetables for adolescent ages. Um, and this was a cross-sectional um, study that was taken. And basically all that means it was a wide variety of adolescent ages. And this one, would, I believe was in um, Brazil. And it's just really important to consider the adolescent uh, years and maybe do they have access to fruits and vegetables? This is another one that maybe it's not encouraged at their home to consume fruits and vegetables. So 3.4 is still great, but it's not the recommended amount of five servings. Um, skipping meals, um, whether this is skipping meals with peers, incomplete breakfast, um, whether that's another time constraint one, um, no snacks provided at school. And from my recollection, there was no time for snacks. So another time constraint. Um, either way, no snacks are consumed. That's a uh, decreased calorie intake than your body needs. So it's still, it's inadequate nutrition and um, or intentional skipping. And this could be as um, disordered eating. Once again, it's important to look at all these environmental factors and connect them back to healthy eating and how they negatively affect, um, how the obstacles negatively affect healthy eating. So one idea um, that was shared in these studies was that skipping meals and the absence of snacks um, was super important and super influential on inadequate eating, inadequate eating patterns. And whether this is skipping meals in the sense of hopefully not, but it is common disordered eating, eating disorders in terms of binge eating, um, anorexia nervosa and um, just disordered eating patterns, whether that means uh, not eating enough calories throughout your day, then your body needs to function and to do those wonderful activities that you do. Um, this is all really important in the adolescent diet because there is a high amount of eating disorders that develop in adolescence. And high consumption of processed foods. So this diet is often characterized by low milk and dairy, high um, low consumption of fruits and vegetables, as we already mentioned right here, high consumption of saturated fat and sodium, sodium salt, you guys know what that is, and added sugars. So um, I guess I want you guys to pause. This can be a one minute pause. Share with your neighbor, do you agree with these, um, I guess, generalizations? We, like I said, we really want, when we're assessing essential nutrients, whether macronutrient in terms of carbohydrate, we know this diet is high in carbohydrate or micronutrient, um, like our phytonutrients and sodium, saturated fat, and uh, some micronutrients like vitamins A and C that's provided with um, fruits and vegetables. It's, um, it's important to consider the environmental factors that come into play within these healthy eating habits. 
Um, we talked a lot about time constraints and maybe what's provided by parents, parental permissiveness. And I want you guys to take a moment to think about who controls what you consume. Do you do all of your own shopping? You don't have to share that out loud, but think about it. Do you choose the ingredients for your lunch? Do you always get to pick the restaurant when you and your friends, even if it's just you and peers, go out to eat? Um, for your particular age group, it's important to understand the many obstacles that do come into play for your own consumption and why this diet may not be considered the healthiest and is because it's high in processed foods and sodium. But um, I really want you guys to consider that these habits like skipping meals and um, high consumption of processed foods, how they may affect um, adolescents in health, unhealthy eating and have actually skipping meals, for example, has been shown that um, habits in low nutritional quality, consum low consumption of fruits and vegetables um, have increased risk for overweight and obesity, another um, illness associated with diet. So like I said, talked a little bit more than I wanted to, but pause the video one minute. Do you agree with these generalizations? Do you think that um, you skip meals off? You don't have to share this directly, but maybe you wanna consider, do you skip meals often? Do you have a high consumption of fruits and vegetables or maybe a high consumption of processed foods? So I'm gonna stop talking, pause, share with your neighbor for one minute, just a quick share. Okay, you're back, you shared with your neighbor, you considered, how environmental factors affect your own healthy eating. Um, I, I shared a lot of information with you. However, I wanna give you solutions. How can you co overcome these specific environmental factors and eat healthier? And um, I really wanna encourage healthier in the sense of including more whole foods and increasing micronutrients. And especially those, you guys have a lot of knowledge about this, but increasing important nutrients in your body um, without restricting. So I don't want you guys to take notes on this um, and look at restricting to 2,000 milligrams, uh, 2,300 milligrams, but really look at maybe how you can adjust your diet to decrease in sodium consumption and increase fruits and vegetables. So remember, we're not restricting here, but we're also educating ourselves on what's important. So consume fruits and vegetables. So USDA dietary guidelines suggest two servings of fruits and three servings of vegetables. Um, let's round that out to five, four to five. Um, really just focusing on that daily, four to five servings of fruits and vegetables. Do not skip meals. Like I said, this has been associated with um, some uh, overweight and obesity. It's important to consider that skipping meals does not always lead to um, decreased consumption, um, but in instead let's create consistent meal and snack times with proper preparation kind of avoiding those time constraints, those environmental factors, um, and really just adjusting uh, between those. I also really highly suggest snacks, um, snack foods with a lot of uh, whole foods is what we like to say um, in their rawest form, raw almonds, uh, you know, little cherry tomatoes, grapes, and really focusing on maybe fruits and vegetable consumption, or maybe like peanuts and just really focusing on whole foods and um, really increasing your snack uh, consumption. And then reduce consumption of processed foods. I know this is so hard, but um, sodium consumption is on average, uh, the data was like over 3000 uh, milligrams per day when it's suggested to be 14 and up uh, 2300 milligrams per day. So assess that sodium consumption, try to bring it down a little bit if you can, saturated fat, we're talking cheese, beef, um, milk, and uh, a lot of lunch meats. You could increase that to 10%. Uh, we know that fat in general should be 10 to 35% of your diet. So if you increase saturated fat to like a little bit less than 10, 10 and under percent of your total calories, that's uh, on target. Calcium consumption is about 1300 milligrams per day. To put that in perspective, um, yogurt is like 300 milligrams of, uh, just one little thing of yogurt is about 300 milligrams of calcium. Remember calcium, vitamin D, great for strong bones. Um, again, we're adding stuff to our diet. We're not going to focus on restricting, but really important in building bones and processed sugars. Don't hate me. Six, six, six teaspoons, teaspoons, the little one, um, or 25 grams per day. 
um, really important to overcome these environmental factors and try to eat a little bit healthier. And just considering um, these environmental factors, it's important to come up with solutions and be able to share these solutions with you guys. So like I said, no skipping meals, at least three meals per day. So satisfactory meals are characterized by consumption of at least three meals per day. This is, again, according to these studies, which are fully referenced at the end. Um, three main meals per day, and it was also associated with healthier eating habits. Um, and along with this, more physical activity, really positive things when you were able to consume at least three meals per day. Regular meal behavior, set a schedule, um, make time for breakfast, pack a snack, um, avoiding those time constraints. And this also goes with um, maybe your environmental factors of the people that surround you, setting a schedule with them and creating regular meal behavior is one of the most important things because it's a, it was shown in this study um, to be a good, I'm trying to point to it, a good marker for diet quality. Okay, and lastly, become involved in preparation. This is um, something that it's actually a little bit anecdotal. This is something that I learned in my own uh, high school and college um, times, <laughs> lack of a better word, become involved in preparation, really work on building your repertoire, going shopping, helping to prepare foods with your parents, whoever is the meal maker, maybe that is you, that already is you, you're already doing that great job, but go shopping, help prepare foods, follow simple recipes, ask for help with needed. And again, like I said, increase consumption of more whole foods. This is considered healthier because you have control of sodium intake. You have control of how much salt you're putting in your own recipe. Um, you can decrease uh, consumption of those saturated fats and maybe focus on more light meats and really focus on your own sugar intake and just all those recommendations that we were just talking about over here of processed foods, when you're involved in that preparation, you are more likely to eat healthier. Um, and also just be more aware of what you're consuming. If you choose to, um, in moderation, have those saturated fats and just you want to enjoy it, you're aware of what you're consuming rather than someone else preparing it for you and you're eating more processed foods. So. Uh, this uh, is the last little in-class activity. So solutions to overcome environmental factors. Share, pause the video for one minute and share one idea with a peer that I maybe did not talk about, but is a great solution that you're thinking about in your head. Go ahead and pause. Okay, you guys should be back. Hopefully you shared one idea with a peer of a solution to overcome some environmental factors that we have discussed earlier. So just a little in, uh, conclusion, the importance um, of the impact of environmental factors on the adolescent's diet include, but are not limited to socioeconomic status, parental support, um, parental permissiveness, physical environment, maybe uh, whether that includes social, relational, um, just uh, coaches, just environment in general, your access to food. Like I said, if you can't access it, if you don't have access via car or vehicle or um, financially, which is also socioeconomic status, it's important to consider these as environmental factors. And then education and dietary behavior. If you do not know what a saturated fat is or what stuff high in sodium is, or that sugar may not be best for you, then, um, it's also another environmental factor that's going to maybe not um, educate you in the best way. So education, dietary behavior is extremely important as well. Okay, that should be it. Hopefully you guys are running off, but thank you so much. Um, my email is this right here. It's just my first name, last name at email.arizona.edu. Um, feedback, Mrs. Andrews will have a paper for feedback or questions. Please feel free to leave questions or comments on this paper, it will actually go to my professor. And my professor uh, relayed to me that she would share them with me and I will email uh, Mrs. Andrews back to answer any of these questions. Um, if you guys are interested in nutritional sciences, I'm extremely passionate about it, would love to share. University of Arizona is a great program if you're looking at applying places um, for in the upcoming years. Um, and just if you were looking at maybe finding more about registered dietitians, please do not hesitate to reach out to me or if you have questions that um, you feel like I could answer based on this lesson, please email them. 
So final activity, um, I have a closing survey monkey activity. This is once again, your last thing. I will send Mrs. Andrews the link and then I'll also attach it in the little description box below. Please complete this. I would really appreciate feedback. There will be a spot for questions. And then also it's gonna be a little check. Did you understand what I was saying? Um, if not, then maybe that's a good uh, activity for me to learn in my own education. Um, but here are some references. Thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. And thank you, Mrs. Andrews, for letting me come into your class.